Chinese interference. China also wanted to interfere, but because of the nuclear threat, China could not play any significant role in that. So ultimately, North Korean forces had to withdraw from South Korea, and uh, a true, you know, uh, armistice took place in 1953. So this armistice um, is called a 38th parallel line, in which they actually. Um, you know, stopped fighting, and it is a 1953 truce line between North Korea and South Korea. So it is also demilitarized zone, and about 36,500 American soldiers were killed in this war. It was a huge, huge, you can say, setback uh, for the Americans. But at the same time, it also brought, uh, you know, a positive image of the America on the forefront. And America was regarded as, uh, you know, able ally, uh, which uh, could be trusted. And same thing was followed by then Pakistan. So Pakistan also saw that how America can go further just to protect their allies. And uh, that's why Pakistan also then later on joined CETO and CENTO, America-led, uh, you know, alliances. And Pakistan uh, wanted America's support and Pakistan believed that yes, if America can support South Korea, why not Pakistan? So um, that was at the time when America, uh, you know, spent a lot of money there. Uh, U.S. also almost lost sixty-seven billion dollars in this war, and um, uh, they also lost about thirty-six thousand people in this Korean War. So even today, um, this is uh, the border and uh, both countries are now uh, trying to resolve their issues and politically now they are talking to each other because North Korea is now a nuclear weapon state and uh, they possess almost, I think, um, all sorts of weapons. Um, and uh, South Korea is not a nuclear weapon state, but they have got support from the US. Um, in, in which they got some air defense systems and, uh, you know, extended nuclear deterrence as well. But um, still, the North Koreans and the South Koreans, they are trying to resolve their issues. They are talking to each other. And this is one of the picture. So what is the economic significance of East Asia? Let's quickly look at the economic significance of East Asia. As I told you before, that the major economies reside in this area. So uh, that's why you can see that uh, like, uh, for example, China is one of the leading economy in the world, second largest economy in terms of GDP, and Japanese, they are the fourth largest economy, and then you've got many other economies. So if we quickly look at the Chinese economy, they are more than $3 trillion now, and their economic growth is also uh, great. Before uh, COVID-19, um, their growth was very you know uh, fast, but after COVID-19, it slowed down. Japanese are also one of the leading economy and a huge economy. They are well connected with the US and the European countries. So that's why their economy is also uh, very good. South Koreans are also a trillion dollar economy, $1.5 trillion economy, and they are also growing. Then you got North Korea, which is a smaller economy because of the sanctions by the US and the European countries. So that's why they are unable to cope up with the, uh, these sanctions. Then you've got Taiwan um, and Hong Kong, Mongolia, Macau. They are also smaller economies of the region. So population-wise, um, this region is very important. China is one point almost 44 billion population. Then you've got uh, another big population is Japan, which is about 126 million. And then you've got smaller populations of this area. But these uh, two countries, like for example, China and Japan, they are the major, you can say, population. And then you've got 51 million population of South Korea as well. So these are the leading economies because of their manpower, skilled labor force. And that's why they are actually leading the world right now in the economic forefront. And uh, this is the reason that they are, uh, you know, dominant in these areas. So uh, this area, uh, in a nutshell, East Asia is one of the most important area. And if you look at the you know, maritime shipping and uh, maritime trade and oil supplies and gas supplies, uh, in that scenario, this is very, very important region. 10.4 million barrels of oil per day pass through this region. State of Malacca, then it goes to South China Sea. And 1.5 million uh, barrel of oil comes from Africa and 0.9 million from other countries. But predominantly, 
most of the supplies, uh, oil and gas supplies, it comes from the Persian Gulf. And uh, it then heads towards South Korea, Japan, and China and other countries. So predominantly, uh, this region is very important when it comes to the oil and gas supplies, when it comes to the maritime traffic, maritime trade, huge cargo ships, you know. So it passed through this region. So in a nutshell, East Asia is uh, one of the most important region in the world in which huge uh, countries like China, uh, you know, uh, Japan, and then other countries are there. And then extra regional powers like America, uh, they are also involved in this region. And over the issue of South China Sea, they are, um, you know, in competition with the Chinese. But China is predominantly a powerful country in this region, and no country in the region, in this region, can challenge the hegemony of China. So China is politically, economically, and strategically a dominant power in East Asia. So um, I have also made a few uh, other lectures like South China Sea. It is available on this channel. You can uh, go through and you can uh, take benefit from that. And you'll find other, other lectures as well, US-Japan competition, US-China uh, strategy competition in the region. So specifically, those um, uh, you know, um, uh, areas covered in other, other lectures. So predominantly East Asia, this was all about East Asia. Now, if you've got any question, you can ask now, please. Thank you.